Right, hey everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Marco Thomas Michel from um, Switzerland, but now from Singapore. Uh, he's at the National University of Singapore. And he's here as a guest lecturer. He'll tell us about quantum learning theory. So uh, the challenge with external lecturers is that they don't know how much you know exactly, right? Mark is at an advantage because he did his PhD here. Uh, so he, he knows the QIT course very well. Uh, but if there's something you don't know, please uh, let Marco know. Right. And so? Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lydia. Um, so there are, yeah, I have maybe one administrative thing. Um, um, so if you have any questions after the lecture, you can contact me by email. Just going to write it down. Probably it's on the web page as well. And um, the other thing is there are the lecture notes are kind of handwritten here. Um, so I can make them available to you after the, the lectures, obviously. But um, I was wondering if, if somebody feels like they can, you know, learn things very well by tacking up uh, the lecture notes, then um, I would be more than willing to, to help you with this. So, so if you want to do this, then, then let me know and I'll give you feedback and, and we, we can make it into a proper lecture notes. Um, but otherwise, I'll just, you, you will just get the handwritten ones, which hopefully will also be helpful. Um, that's um, one thing. Then the other one is uh, more personal. So I, I, I did a test this morning. So if you hear me cough, uh, don't be too worried. It's, it's all good. I, I have a little bit of a cold, but um, yeah, should be fine. Otherwise, you just move to the back. <laughs> Or no, uh, but I, I did the test this morning, so it's all good. Um, good. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is learning theory or quantum learning theory, which is um, well and. Obviously, only selected topics. I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to give you full overview of the, the field in two lectures. Um, but what is learning theory, um, and how does it distinguish itself from from machine learning, which you probably all heard of? Um, it's essentially the theoretical underpinnings of of machine learning. Although, if you if you would ask practitioners of machine learning, then um, they would probably not even be that interested in, in the learning theory. Because in practice, in machine learning, it's a lot of just trying, trial and error, um, and kind of getting to know the black magic of how to set parameters and, and, and get um, protocols to work. But there is a theory behind it in which we look at idealized models um, and for those, we can actually give um, rigorous guarantees. Okay? But these idealized models are not necessarily uh, the ones that are really used in practice then. So there is a bit of a gap. Um, but since I hope um, you like uh, mathematics as much as me, then uh, these are the, the simplified models are the ones that we can actually analyze. So we'll have to uh, deal with them and hope to learn something for the real practice as well. Um, good, so, so for the first part, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview. And here, um, there's one kind of famous diagram that, that appears in most talks about quantum machine learning. Um, and this looks as follows. It's very simple. So you have two axes. Um, one of them is for the data, and one is for the algorithm. And uh, for each of those, you can choose 
whether you're going to look at classical, I'm just going to write C, or quantum. Um, and then look at, at kind of these different intersections. So this is the traditional um, machine learning or learning theory where we have classical data that we are analyzing using classical algorithms. Um, then what we are going to look at today is an example in here where the data is quantum, but the algorithm we use to analyze it is classical. So today we're going to look at um, quantum state tomography. So that's an example in here. Um, and another example that we most likely will have time to look at is the multi-armed uh, quantum bandits. Well, it's a funny name. Um, you'll, you'll see what... Is it too small? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I'll tend to write. But it just needs to fit into the... Um, I hope it will be visible. Um, but anyway, so these are two, two examples um, um, that we look at. And there, yeah, the, the data is really quantum, and we look at classical algorithms. So in state tomography we want to learn a quantum state, so we want to find the, the density matrix of a, of a quantum system. So that's quantum. Um, but the way we actually do it is by doing an experiment, doing measurements, and then doing some classical computation that gives us an estimate of this density matrix. So the algorithm you're using is, is classical. Um, now, these are very important I mean, this area is very important for experimental um, science, obviously, because we want to learn quantum systems, uh, we want to learn channels. Um, but maybe more exciting from a machine learning um, point of view is, is this field here, where we have classical data that, um, that we usually encounter and want to analyze using machine learning. Um, but we use now quantum algorithms to do so. And we're hoping that we get an advantage out of using quantum algorithms instead of uh, classical algorithms. OK, and, and so in this, here we're also going to look at an example, um, which is quantum pack uh, learning. Um, and um, so I'm going to introduce these when I, when I get to them. It's, I just wanted to, to list a few items. And then there is obviously this, this whole area where we have quantum algorithms and quantum data, but we, we're not going to cover um, this. So these are just some examples of, of, um, um, of problems to consider. Um, there are obviously many more um, that, that we can think of, many more models to, to study. So we just have to focus on a few to give you a little bit of a, a, a picture. So just some, some more um, uh, words on, on, on this. So essentially what we are looking at is an intersection of statistics and machine learning. So this is important to know because most of the research that's going on in this field is maybe not done by people working in machine learning, but by people working in statistics. Um, so they want to, they use their, the tools that you need are mostly tools from statistics to, to analyze this. And in, in, in case of, of quantum machine learning, 
then um, we would just add statistics, machine learning, and quantum information. So it's an interdisciplinary um, field. And um, the nice thing for us is that a lot of the tools that are used are tools from information theory. So um, we can um, uh, we can apply entropies and so on, and we'll see that um, today, how, how we can use these tools. Um, as I said, there is a tension between this and practical machine learning um, um, because of the simplicity of the models that we need to, that we have to um, assume here to make any an analytical progress. Um, but um, at least for the, the topic covered today, um, which is um, quantum state tomography, there, there is actually, the, that's a proper model. We don't need to simplify it. We, we really want to, to learn a state. Um, but for some of the others, there are certainly simplifications need to be made to, to be able to analyze things. Good. Um, so um, that is yeah, a little overview. Now, the next thing I want to do is, um, yeah, Lydia already gave you a warning that the notation might be, might be a little bit different. So I just have a few things that I will use heavily. So, so it's good to remind you um, what I mean. Um, and, um, and you let me know if you don't know these things, and then I can... Uh, explain a little bit more. So what we'll need uh, certainly is norms. So we have the Schotten P norm. So just denote by this. Um, do you know how it's defined for, for quantum states? No? OK. Um, then it's a good thing we're doing this. Um, so the P norm is just defined by um, taking the p power of uh, sorry of the modulus of the operator, and then whoops, sorry, and then taking the p uh, root of the trace. Do you know what the modulus is of a of a density matrix? Well, for density matrix, it's easy. You don't need to do anything. It's already positive. But otherwise, you would use the, the polar decomposition. Um, so maybe I should just write x here, because it can be general. Um, and so you would do the polar decomposition, and then throw away the unitary part, and just have to the positive operator that's left. Okay, you would actually. The, the only examples of this we will need is the two norm, so, and the one norm. Um, so the two norm um, can be simplified, a square root of trace, and then it would just be x dagger x, um, and the one norm. is the trace of the modulus, which for um, if this is a normal operator, you, you can just see this as the sum of the eigenvalues, the uh, modulus of the eigenvalues. So let's say it's d-dimensional. Then we would just add up the eigenvalues of x. OK, and then I use this notation where um, I write in the subscript trace, or TR, um, and that is just 1 half times the, the 1 norm of, of 
of x. Um, now, another thing I'm, I'm using or will be using, or at least, or maybe in the, in the homework you will use it, um, is that if you have trace norm or trace distance, so this would be the trace distance between the two states, rho and uh, sigma, uh, then we can write this as an optimization problem where um, we maximize over some positive operator and just look at trace p times uh, rho minus sigma. Okay, so this, maybe you have seen it, uh, maybe not. Um, what you should probably have seen is the entropy or entropic quantities So here I write just H of some matrix rho. I mean, I'm sure you use that in, in thermodynamics quite a bit. So this is defined as trace of rho minus trace of low rho log rho. Um, and we will need the mutual information. So mutual information between two uh, quantum systems A and B. Or in fact, we will only need it when, when A is, is classical. So maybe I just give that expression. Um, and so here we, we, we're taking a state, a bipartite state that is classical on, on X with some distribution P of X. And then some state on um, on the B system that's indexed by X. Okay, this is a classical quantum state. And yes. Um, yeah, so here P is a positive operator. Um, okay, so, so it's a positive operator. Its eigenvalues are between 0 and 1. So one way to, to write this is saying that P is smaller than... So if I, if I have something like this, A smaller than B, that means just by, by taking... Um, a on the other side, that B minus A needs to be positive, definite, or semi-definite. Um, so that's how to interpret these kind of um, inequalities. And yeah, and this is well defined now, right? What, it, what this means, logic equals zero just means needs to be positive, semi-definite operator. Okay, um, so in, in this special case of the um, mutual information, so, so, uh, uh, by the way, are you aware of this, this formula for the trace distance? Okay. Yes, okay, so, so I'm not going to, uh, if you want to see the proof, you can go into the, your notes for that, but for now I just state it as fact. Um, okay, so, so the mutual information, um, one can see as the difference between the, the entropy on the B system. So the, the entropy of the margin on B minus, um, or let me write it in, in this way, H of B minus H of B given X. Um, and if I 
plug now in actually the, the, the densities. So I'm, I'm, I'm abusing notation a little bit, right? Because here I'm putting in the subsystems. So this, this would be x and this is b. Um, whereas here I put in as an argument the, the density operator itself. Um, but what, I'm, what this really means is that this is h of the marginal on b, which is just the uh, average state. Right? If I trace out x here, then I get this state here. Minus b given x, and, and this is just the average um, entropy of, of the b system. So this c conditional entropy, um, you can just see it as an average entropy for a fixed x. So here we would have average of h of rho b x. Oops. OK, so this probably you should have seen in, in the quantum information theory lecture as well, but just as a, as a reminder. Um, then the final thing, because I'm going to use them so often, is the Pauli matrices, which I'm hoping you're very familiar with. Um, and I just gonna, I'm going to call them x, y, and C, I'm not sure what you're used to. Sometimes they're called sigma x, sigma y, and sigma c. Um, I'm just going to use this notation because I'm going to write them so often and I don't want to write so many sigmas. Um, OK, but I'm, I hope I don't need to, to write down what these matrices are. Otherwise, let me know. Um, Good, OK, so, so there might be other things coming up, as mentioned. Um, and in that case, yeah, just ask. I'm very happy to explain more. OK, I'm going to leave this here for a bit. Um, then we can start with the actual um, topic, which is quantum state tomography for today. And I'm going to first introduce formally what the, what the task is. So we have a, a source. Now, source sounds very abstract. Um, but you can imagine this is just an experiment you do that you can repeat. Right? You can repeat the, the experiment many times in the same way, and it will produce uh, some quantum system that is always in the same state. So it's, it's a reproducible experiment um, that produces some state rho each time. Um, and this state rho is unknown. You don't know what, like, you, you, you know which um, buttons to press in your experimental setup and which, um, um, how to, to adjust the settings and so on. But you don't actually know what it produces. You hope, maybe you have some hope that it will produce the state that you want. Uh, but um, you, you need to check that, right? Um, and in this case, you, you actually just don't know anything about it. So the source produces, um, and I say reliably, um, because it's always going to be the same, um, an unknown state rho, which um, we assume is in some d-dimensional Hilbert space. So it's a state on a d-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, So what we do is we collect 
these states, so we, we repeat this experiment n times, and we collect uh, the combined system, which is in the state rho tensor n. That's the most general thing we could do. Um, we could also just measure each one separately, which in, in practice is what we will what we'll do and in the protocol that we look at. But in, in general, we can just collect um, n copies of this state, and that would be a system in the state rho tensor n. So we collect n copies of rho um, and perform a measurement now so measurement is p of m which i call here m and it's just given by some p of m elements um, which are positive and, and sum up to identity. Right. I'm assuming you heard about POVMs. Some point is the most general way to describe um, measurements in, in quantum mechanics. And I'm, I'm trying to be as general as possible here because we want to make statements about the, the general model. Even though in practice we will actually look at very simple measurements, we will just measure um, poly matrices today. But we also give um, impossibility bounds. We essentially, we're saying that whatever measurements you do, you cannot do better than this and that. And for that, we want to use the most general model possible because that makes these types of statements stronger. Um, so that's why I want to introduce it in, in a, as much generality as possible. Um, OK, so, so we, we, we collected these states, then we did the measurement. Uh, so now we get x, right? So, so we do the measurement. So now we get some value x from some set of possible measurement outcomes. Um, and now the last task is to actually form uh, an, an estimate of, of what rho is. So we will, um, given that x, We construct an estimate rho hat um, of x, so it's it's a function. You can think of this as a as a density operator valued function, right? So the the input of the function is is an x, the measurement outcome, and the output of the function is is a density operator. And we call this rho hat. So the hat always indicates that we are, it's an estimate of something, of some underlying true state, which is here rho. Um, OK, so we, we construct this, this estimate. Um, and now we say that the, the, essentially the triple um, comprised of the x, which is the, the set of measurement outcomes, um, the measurement scheme and, and this estimator function, this constitutes um, geez, a tomography or a quantum tomography scheme. Okay, and, and so the question is now, okay, um, the goal was to learn rho. Um, now, maybe we need to um, think a little bit about what this actually means and, and how, how difficult that task is. So, the goal is clearly that this rho hat of x should be um, close to rho. Um, but 
this is a function of, of x, right? x is a random variable. x is what we get from the measurement. So it follows the distribution that is given by Born's rule, right? Um, so given this given x here, actually, that we know that the probability of measuring a particular x is given by Born's rule, which would be here trace of rho tensor n m x. So this is a random variable. Um, and so now we're creating from, from the outcome of this experiment, we're, we're trying to form an, an estimate of what, what the state really is. So this is also going to be a random variable. This, this density operator itself is a random variable. Um, so what does it mean to be close to rho? Um, we can ask it to be close to rho in expectation, for example. Um, but maybe that's a little bit, we'll see, that's a little bit too weak a, a requirement. So what we want is that this um, is close with high probability. So we want a statement like this. So more precisely, we want a statement of this form, that the probability of this row hat x. And so now I'm going to write, egg, um, well, it's, it's hard to see which x's are capitalized and which are not. But you can see it from context. When it's a random variable, I'm going to write it capitalized. So this is a capitalized x, um, because this is, is where the randomness comes in. And I want the probability that this um, trace distance between the, the estimate and the, the actual row, probability that this trace distance is small should be large. For some uh, hopefully small parameters, epsilon nu, which have to be larger than zero, though. Okay, so so now I'm going to try to convince you that these kinds of statements is actually the the best thing that we could hope for. Uh, we cannot uh, hope to be, for example, in an epsilon ball always with, with probability 1 or with, with certainty for any fixed number of copies. Um, um, and the, this, the simplest, maybe simplest way to see this so, so this is why can we not do better? The simplest way to see this is, is look at the, at the very um, classical example with Bernoulli trials. So this is now really statistics. Bernoulli trial is, is the, the coin toss, uh, but biased coin tosses. So you have two outcomes. Um, with, with certain probabilities. So you can look at, at the case where uh, you have a fair coin, for example, which means you have probabilities uh, one half and one half. Or you have like a maximally unfair coin, uh, where um, you always get heads. So the first one is, is the probability for heads, and the second one, tails. And, and yeah, sorry, I'm a bit uh, unclear here. So these are the probabilities.
okay, for heads and tails. Now, what happens is that we don't know what coin we have, right? And um, so we're now going to do some scheme where we want to find out which of these coins is, is the true one. Um, and let's say we observe all heads. So we just get a sequence, we, we measure, I mean, we look at these coin tosses, um, and we get all, uh, every time, a heads. Now, our estimate has to be that, that this is the unfair coin, right? Because otherwise, I mean, for this coin, we, we would always get heads. And um, if we, we guess anything else, we'll be far away from, um, from this coin. Um, especially if we, if we guess it, that it's something like this. But you can see that even for this coin, if n is uh, um, a finite number, there is a finite probability of always seeing heads. Um, the, the probability will be exponentially small in n. So it's going to be one half to the n um, to see this particular sequence of all heads. But it's still it's a it's a positive number for each n. And so if if we had this coin and observed all heads, uh, then we will make the wrong estimate. And so so we can't really ever hope to have certainty in, in our estimates. Um, so this is kind of important conceptually, I think, to, to understand um, that there are limitations to, to what we can say, what we can conclude from experimental data. Um, yes? I mean, you almost always get some some trade-off like this because there are very unlikely um, sequences of, of measurement outcomes that you can observe in your experiment, and and if you get them, you will make the wrong conclusion, and there's just. Yes, so, so if you take a Bayesian, I mean, that's true, this is a frequentist kind of viewpoint on the, on the problem. Um, in the Bayesian approach, you just shift kind of the burden to the prior, um, um, because but here we don't assume anything about the underlying distributions of these states. We don't want to, if we knew something about which, or uh, let's say with the coins, if you knew something about which coins are more likely than others, um, then, then we can make stronger statements. Um, but we'll generally we'll be in this in, always in this situation that, that we cannot, from, from finite data, we cannot um, make a, a certain conclusions. But one can make this, this probability, actually one can make it, uh, this eta one can make it arbitrarily small, exponentially small in the number of samples. So this is not really that much of a problem. Um, but it's just to, to argue why um, I need to write down such a complicated um, statement. Um, and um, cannot, yeah, hope for, for something stronger necessarily. So, okay, so maybe I should write what I actually said. Um, so the point was kind of if we observe. A sequence with all heads. Mm. 
we must conclude that the coin is unfair. Uh, even though this sequence also has a positive probability um, when the coin is fair. Okay, good. Um, then um, maybe one last thing. So these um, this object here is called a confidence region. So the the ball um, given by states that are close to the our estimate. So that would be the states that are close to rho hat. Um, called the confidence region. And um, what we know is that the probability of finding the true row in the confidence region uh, is larger or equal to 1 minus mu. Or we can call this um, an epsilon confidence region if we want. And so no, we shouldn't call it an epsilon. Sorry, we're not going to do that because it's a bit confusing. The confidence is actually this, um, the new here. So usually we, we, we would say that um, often in statistics you, you talk about the sigmas, how many sigmas. Um, that that's gives you the confidence region. So if, you, if you're uh, three sigmas, I think that's uh, 1%. So then that would correspond to eta being... 0 0.01, and then you say then you have the the three sigma confidence. I don't know. In, at CERN, they they use more higher sigma, so that would just correspond to smaller mu's here. So that means that their experiment um, uh, yeah, I mean, if if you would boil down what their actual statement is that that they can make, it would be something similar to this, like they would say the mass of the of the Gibbs boson is close to what they measured um, with certain parameter here with high confidence right from from the data they observed. So it would be statements like this that if you actually boil down to what the mathematical statement is that they they're making. But the language is, is a different. They, they would talk in terms of sigmas but the sigmas are just in the in the normal distribution. Um, you know how this probability behaves, and yeah, is it three sigmas that is one percent? I think so. So that's the one to keep in mind. And I think two sigmas is five percent here. So just um, to keep, yeah, that's uh, sometimes useful to know that they are not doing anything magical. They also get statements of this form um, for obviously slightly different problems. Um, OK, so, so that's a confidence region. Um, and now, so what do we want to do? Um, so I guess it's almost time for the 
break? Yeah, let's let's do the break first. Then five minutes. Um, okay, uh, let's continue. So just um, one last notion to introduce is the concept of an, an unbiased estimator. An unbiased estimator is, is one for which the expectation of row hat um, actually gives you Roll. Mm -hmm. I have a general question. Am I still correct to the belief of random variables is just necessarily true? No, that, I mean, that, that depends on your scheme. You, you might choose very different measurements and, and, and have different sets here. Um, So, so it's kind of the, the combination of, of these uh, things. I mean, you can you can think of them as a one single operation where, like for instead of an, having an x here as a measurement outcome, you would have here the estimate directly. But then it's kind of mathematically a bit confusing. So I just introduced this this artificial in a, in a way um, intermediate object. Which is this this random variable, and then from that create the the estimate. But the point is just that you you measure something, and and from from the information you gain through the measurement, you you create the the estimate. The set itself is not so unique. Um. Yeah. So in this case. Um, it's indeed a, a fixed joint measurement on all the n copies in this general setting. You could also think about adaptive schemes where you measure, uh, let's say you measure the first state, and then depending on the outcome, you decide on what basis to measure the second state in and so on. So you could also think of, of adaptive schemes. Um, um, yeah, so this, this one is, is fixed. Now, then one can show that the, maybe this this most general thing here with, where we do a joint measurement on all the states is always more powerful than um, adaptive right. ones. Uh, although although in, in, in one has to be careful with such statements. I think that is true. I, I couldn't just now prove it. So, so um, here we, we just, yeah, we restrict ourselves to... to um, settings where everything is decided beforehand, not uh, adaptive. Um, okay, so the unbiased estimator, and now um, I want to to propose some 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 questions that we might be interested in. Um, Or, or more, mostly one question. One question: What are the fundamental relationships between our different variables? So that would be n, the number of. Well, the number of samples, um, epsilon, the size of the, the confidence region, and um, the third parameter to be interested in is the dimension of the um, of the Hilbert space. And and for now we assume that that um, the eta is constant. We could also include the, the, the eta in this. Um, so we have different parameters of our protocols, and um, they obviously have some dependence. Um, so one thing to 
to think about. So is there, if we want um, epsilon to be smaller, for example, then you can imagine we will need more samples, right? Um, so if, if, if epsilon is supposed to decrease and we, we want a smaller confidence region, then we need to increase uh, n. And if we, on the other hand, want to look at um, systems with larger dimension, then we also need to increase and to keep the same accuracy. I mean, this would be our intuition, um, I think. So that the, the first one is kind of clear. More, more accuracy means more, uh, more samples are required. The, the dimension one, uh, you can think of uh, there are just more free parameters in in a in a higher uh, dimensional state. We usually have or, or the d squared uh, parameters in the density operator, and we kind of need to learn all of them. So, so that requires more more measurements, right? To do that to the same accuracy. Um, so the 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 point now is. Well, twofold. So, so what we can do is, we can propose um, protocols that achieve uh, certain epsilons and, and n's, and that gives us a, a relationship between the factors. That means such relationships can be achieved. Um, or we can ask the, the the converse question, which is, are there fundamental limits? So, so do we know that, for example? Um, how much this must uh, n must increase as we decrease epsilon? Is there a fundamental limit that no tomography protocol can uh, overcome? Okay, and then we can compare these two bounds and see uh, if they if they maybe match, and then we know that our protocol is 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 optimal. Well, this is the kind of analysis we would often do in in. Uh, in uh, information theory, in channel coding, for example, where we say uh, find a rate that is achievable, and then we show that this is actually optimal. Um, and the same kind of, of analysis we can also do here. OK, so the first part is um, um, the so-called achievability, so we will will actually propose a protocol. Um, so this would be this A1. Uh, a simple tomography protocol. For qubits. Now, because it's, it's kind of conceptually um, well, most of the concepts are already contained in the qubit case, and um, we can really go through all the proofs for the qubit case. So that's why I'm, I'm going to restrict to um, um, this for now. Um, but many of these things can can then be t be, be generalized to to large dimensional systems. It's just uh, a little bit easier this way. Um, and so, so we, we stri restrict ourselves to to qubits for the the rest of the um, lecture, well, for, for for most of it at least. Um, so we want to propose a protocol. Now, um, to start with, um, we need to to introduce a couple of tools. So this is a, a classical. Warm up. Um, and this is just now statistics. So 
consider IID. Does everybody know what IID stands for? Yeah, good. Um, random variables. X and uh, with an index i, so so i goes from one to n, um, and those random variables, let's say, are in in some set minus one and one. And they're distributed according to. Um, this is a probability of being minus one is uh, p, and then correspondingly being one is one minus p. And so, so we have this sequence of random variables, um, and what we are after is the distribution, right? So. So this p, p is unknown. I mean, you can. I mean, it's, it's it's the same as the coin example before, right? You can think of heads and tails instead of minus one and and one. Um, and the point is, we want to find p. So. Now, observing a, a sequence, x1 to xn, right, they each have values minus 1 and 1. What would be um, an, a good estimator of, for p? So if you just observe a sequence, what would what would be your guess of what P is? So the estimator, let's call this P hat of P. Yes, so the, the frequency, right? The empirical frequency of of the, um, the sample. So one way to write this so this is now uh, as a function of of the whole sequence. So maybe I write this as um, well if I just write the x without subscripts, I mean the, the whole sequence. So this this I call x. I could, or maybe I underline it so it's a vector. Um, so this would be um, one over n, which is the, the number of, of samples, times essentially. Um, an indicator function or a counting function for observing um, the minus one, right? The minus one is what gives us the probability. Now, this is just counting how many times I see uh, the minus one. I'm counting them it's a bit of a weird way of writing it. I could have just said, okay, you, you look at the whole sequence, you count the number of minus ones and, and then divide by n. I want to write it as a sum, um, which we'll see, you, you'll see in a second why, why I want to do that. And so that's my uh, estimator, and then the distribution is, is just going to be 
uh, p hat and 1 minus p hat. Right? That's going to be my estimate of the full distribution. So this is also called the empirical frequency. Um, good. So the first thing I can check is um, if this is an unbiased estimator. That's always good to, to, to check. Um, because unbiased estimates are, are, are often what we are after. So if I take the expectation of this, now with x being a random variable, um, then, OK, so this linear, so that's nice. I can put the expectation inside the sum. And what is the expectation of this indicator function? Well, with probability p, it will be 1. And with probability 1 minus p, it will be 0. So this is just p, right? So this whole thing is, is, is really p for, for each. I mean, this averaging doesn't do anything. OK, so, so that's good. Um, it's an unbiased estimator. So in expectation, it gives me the the right p. Um, now, what more can we say about this? Well, now we are going to use the ID structure. Um, let me see, because I'm going to keep this here. So, using the fact that p hat is a sum of i i d random variables. Now, OK, let me justify this claim. So I mean, it's obviously a sum. Um, and these indicators are themselves id random variables. So if, if x is a, is a random variable, uh, for each i, it's independent. right? We, that's, that's how we started with. Uh, the xi's are independent. So also, these indicator functions themselves are independent random variables. But now, we, we know a lot of things about sums of independent random variables. Um, for example, and I'm going to just state this this here. So you, you know uh, we have the, the weak law of large numbers. We have the strong law of large numbers. Uh, but what I'm using here is, is called the Höfting's inequality, or Höfting bound. And it states that the probability of this sum being far away from its expectation. OK, this, this we have already verified is equal to p. But Höftingbaum would say is that for sum of ID random variables, uh, probability of being far away from the mean is um, small. So the probability of being delta far away, in fact, can be bounded uh, by um, exponential decay. So this exact form of, the, of this, this is called the concentration bound. Uh, this is a, a concentration bound. There are various of those. Um, sometimes you hear Chernoff bound or Höfting bound. They all do the same things. They, they tell us something about the tails of the distribution. Um, 
and uh, so by the central limit theorem, we kind of know that these sums of, of random variables converge to a Gaussian um, a distribution, and the Gaussian has tails when we are far away from the mean. Well, this is not really... Uh, well, this is delta is, is far in the sense that these things are normalized with n. So, and here we, we don't um, normalize with n, right? So in a sense, this delta is actually far. Um, then the, this, this probability is really exponentially bounded, like the, the, the Gaussian away from the, the mean has, uh, has this exponential tail. But this bound is very general. It holds for any kind of distribution of of um, of the random variable. So this this Höfting bound is is very general. It just assumes that, um, in fact, this this random uh, variable that appears in this sum is is bounded between zero and one. That's the only thing that actually goes into this. Uh, okay, but I'm not gonna. We will need this this type of, of bound, but I just want to kind of argue why, why this, uh, we, we kind of can expect something like this to happen, because it's a sum of ID random variables. I'm not going to prove these uh, statistics bounds. Um, I mean, that's the only one we actually need. But you see, in, in a way, you already see now that this kind of has the form of what we later want, right? Um, so we have this, you can think of this as a confidence um, region. Um, and the probability of being outside this confidence region is, is exponentially small. Um, good. Okay, so this was kind of a, a classical warm-up. Yes? Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the thing that we're summing over is this indicate the function, right? It's between 0 and 1. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit confusing. Actually, in the, in the example, we'll just go through the, 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 um, the... We will need variables that go from minus 1 to 1. And then this bound slightly changes here. Uh, yes, okay, good. So that's kind of the, we want to use this, this kind of behavior of, of ID random variables um, in order to come up with, uh, give our guarantees for our estimate. Good. Um, so how do we do this? Well, if you want to estimate the qubit, it's a little bit more difficult because here we just had one parameter that we needed to learn, right? One, one probability. In the qubit, we obviously have uh, more parameters. Um, and um, so first, the first thing to do is kind of find a, a nice parameterization of the qubit. Um, I'm sure you know a nice parameterization of the qubit. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm assuming this is all repetition. Um, so we have the Bloch representation. of a qubit. And now we have the poly matrices and these three variables um, are x, y, and c, or you can think of them as being one vector. And these um, are now in the in the sphere, right? They they form a sphere. So if, if the um, um the, the squares of these 
sorry. <coughs> the squares of these need to, to sum up to less than one. And then we, we, we have a state. So this is the block sphere representation. Um, so we, we, we can think of this as a, as a vector norm. This must be small or equal to one. Now, how do we find these parameters? Uh, so if, if I give you such a state, how do you find um, R, Rx, for example? What, what, what measurement would you do? Yes? Yes, so, so if you do, if you compute this expectation, so you now measure an observable, so before I was talking about P of Ms, but you know the relationship to, to observables, we just multiply, like we, we measure in the eigenbasis of, of x and then multiply with the eigenvalue. So we get this expectation um, of, of the poly. And if you do that, then that's exactly Rx. Um, this is because if you, uh, x is traceless, so, so kind of if you do, this part will drop out immediately. X squared is identity, so, so that gives you a 2, which cancels out here. Um, and with Y and C, you know that if, if X times Y is proportional to, to C, for example. Like if you multiply two polys, you get something proportional to the, the third poly um, matrix. And poly matrices are traceless, so if you trace over that, it's, it's 0. So... This is just, if, you, if you're unsure about this, then it's, it's probably worth um, doing the, the computation quickly. But um, yeah, we get, we get these relations for, for x, y, and, and c. So, so that's good. Um, now, the point is these are expectation values of our measurements, right? Um, if we do one single measurement, we will not get Rx uh, immediately, right? This is only uh, an in expectation we will get Rx. Um, so otherwise it would be a bit too easy. If we would just need to do three measurements and we would know the full state, which is obviously not... Um, not the case. So, so that's where, um, essentially, this is the quantum information part, and the rest of, of it is the statistics. Um, um, so what we want to, in, in the end, ensure is having um, an, an epsilon ball in trace distance. So one, one thing, useful thing to, to also remind ourselves of is that the trace distance between two qubits in the block representation um, now if we do this uh, and and we have the representation here so if I, if I take a difference of two then you can see that kind of the identity part immediately drops out but what I'm left with is Um, these differences
in, in trace norm, and I also took out the one half from, from the representation. So I, I get something like this, and now I need to, to compute the norm of this, which um, um, is not too difficult, but uh, still requires a little bit of work. So what we can do is, we let's call this delta x, delta y, the c. So I can write this here as um, two by two matrix. And here I would get delta x minus, yeah, minus i delta y to x plus i to y. OK, and now I, um, I'm hoping you know how to compute. Sorry, this is a bit confusing. This is minus delta c. It's a two by two matrix. Um, this trace norm is 1 over 4 times the, just the 1 norm. And the 1 norm we have seen, um, or maybe not, um, is just the sum of the cardinality of the eigenvalues of the matrix. So I don't really need to... Um, do very much with this except finding the eigenvalues, and then I can compute the norm. Um, so how do you find the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix without doing too much work? That's, there, there's a trick for that that you, you should know. It saves you a lot of time. You never diagonalize it, for example. Yes. Very good. So you find the trace and the determinant, right? Um, the trace is zero, so we know that lambda one plus lambda two is zero, and the determinant is is the product, um, and the determinant is just minus r squared here. Okay, you just get, I mean, you, you do the determinant cap computation and you see that it's minus r squared. Um, this means that the eigenvalues are just plus minus um, the norm of r. Well, okay, it's not really, okay, I'm a bit confused. I should call this delta. So that's just the, ve the vector of, of differences. And so this whole thing, so you get two times the, this norm. Um, um, so you get one half. And what this actually is, is r minus r prime two norm distance. Right, so now I'm just plugging in the, the values, which is very nice uh, to know because it means that trace distance between two qubits is just the, t the two norm or the Euclidean distance in the block sphere, which is, uh, is very convenient. Um, okay, so, so that's what we need to, to estimate, right? We need to ensure that this is small, and thus that the, the two norm there is small. Um, OK, so good. So now, now we have all the ingredients together. And um, Lydia, when, when do I stop? OK, good. Uh, then I'll try to speed up. Um, so
So now we have all the ingredients together to, to now write down what the protocol is. I mean, you can imagine what it does. It will measure the three observables. And it, it will take n over 3. Let's say n is, is mod 3 is 0, so it's divisible by 3 for convenience. Uh, it will measure this many times the x, y, and c, and record the values. So this gives some values of x1 to xm. This gives y1 to ym. So this is the first part, and then uh, this is the measurement, and the, the, the estimator will just compute rho x hat as the, the average value you, you get, right? So hopefully the average of, of this will be close to the expectation value for, for m large, um, and so on. And then we construct rho hat by just using these parameters. Now that's kind of a very natural thing to do. Do you see a problem with this? Yes. Yes, exactly. So these are generally just values between. I mean, the x's are between minus one and one. So so the this average is also going to be between minus one and one. But it's not certain that uh, this relation holds for the hat quantities. Um, now, this is really, I mean, in practice, really a problem um, because this is what you, you know, if you, if you just do a basic quantum experiment, this is often what you actually do. Um, I'm running this protocol to find your, your, your density, your qubit density. Um, and if you do this, you have, um, need to make sure that this is actually a state. So what you can do, it's, 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 it might be lying somewhere outside the block sphere. Um, you can just project it onto the block sphere. It's a nice convex set. You just project it onto it, and then you have a state. Um, so that solves the problem that, that it's not... Uh, uh, might not be a state. Um, it also ensures that the, the, the estimate only gets better by, by doing this. So th this is not really a problem for uh, the statistical analysis that we're doing. Um, the problem, though, is then that you get lots of pure states. So you will think um, your, your, your um, experiment is, is producing pure states um, because right when, when you project onto the block sphere, the boundary of the block sphere is is pure states. And so you'll see lots of pure states. Uh, so you have no noise in your experiment. Um, but this is just a statistical artifact because you're projecting um, onto, onto the block sphere. And this is also problematic. Like It, it, it can lead to, to wrong um, conclusions. Now, we're not going to uh, worry about this. We're actually going to later on discuss an algorithm that doesn't have this problem. Um, but yeah, just be be aware of this. Um, we um, and and uh, one way to get around this is just to not worry about the estimate itself, but just the confidence region. So the confidence region is is just the intersection of the the epsilon ball around this point, 
and the and the block sphere, and and that intersection will usually be non-empty. Right? It it has to be non-empty because we have a guarantee that this, or we will show that we have a guarantee that the state lies within it with high probability. So with high probability, that intersection will be non-empty and it will contain both mixed and pure states. So if you just think about the confidence region, then uh, then you're fine. But the actual estimate uh, is might lie outside the, the sphere. Okay, good. Um, so just very quick now, how do we analyze this? Um, so we want to bound the probability that this is larger than epsilon. This should be small. Um, now, <clears throat> what we can do is just essentially plug in what we just computed. So we've seen that this is the two norm distance between R and R hat. Um, now, and I used the, the factor the one half here. Now, what I can do is to to split this because I I don't really want to deal with um, this this total probability here. But since it's a sum, or maybe yeah, these two norms are actually a, is a sum, right? So let me let me um, um, abuse notation a little bit. So this i uh, it just counts through the x, y, and c. Um, so we we have this statement. Now we can use the fact that if this is supposed to be large. Um, then at least one of the parts of the sum must be large. Okay, so we can we can rewrite this, and and it's now it's an inequality because it's not necessary that. Um, well, the the conclusion only goes the, the the implication only goes this direction, not not the other way. So what I'm I'm going to say here is that instead of the sum, <coughs> I'm just going to require. Uh, so this is a logical or. Um, so I'm, I'm taking the or of three statements. And the statements are that, that these things are larger than 2 epsilon over 3. Um, so the point is that if, if this is true, then at least one of the i's must be larger than... Uh, Two epsilon over three. Okay, otherwise I cannot uh, um, violate this. Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, let me fix this by putting here four epsilon squared. Um, yes, correct. Um, good. Um, and now I can use the union bound. And take the square root again on both sides. And then I get 2 epsilon over square root of 3 here. Okay, so now I split kind of this, the or into um, uh, individual um, probabilities, and, and those are exactly of the form that that we already looked at. So, so these guys are. Um, I can bound by Höfting now. 
And essentially, and maybe somebody can uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, what I get is uh, this bound. So they're smaller than... Well, essentially, you have to plug in n times this squared, um, and then it's divided by 2 because... Now these R's really are between minus 1 and, and 1, or divided by 4, yeah. Um, so if you, if, you, if you look up the Höfting bound, which you can find on, on Wikipedia, then I think this is exactly what you get. I'm not too worried about it because it actually doesn't matter exactly what these factors are. Um, uh, but the point is that these kind of statements is exactly what, what we can bound using Höfting because... <coughs> we have seen that Rx, or these Ris, are sums of ID random variables, and furthermore, the expectation of Rx is just the expectation of the Xm, which is exactly, as we've seen, um, uh, Rx. Where have you seen that? We have seen that somewhere, somewhere else. But... Um, Okay, good. Um, so just to conclude, this means that we can choose the, the eta to be 6 e to the minus 2 over 9 n epsilon squared. And if we have a constant eta, let's say we want 0 0.01 or something, or even smaller, um, then we see that we need to choose n as 1 over epsilon squared. Um, to make sure that we have enough samples. So in this protocol, we need 1 over epsilon squared times some constant samples to, to achieve um, um, confidence region of epsilon in trace distance. So that's a statement we, we get out of this. Okay, if, if you want uh, confidence region to be smaller, need more samples. And that, that's kind of the relationship. Okay, good. Then that's it for today. And we'll, next time we'll show that this is actually optimal. <laughs>